Hello, and welcome to chapter 11 of our Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe read-through. I'm Jem Bloomfield, the reader at St John the Baptist Parish Church in Beeston, and the chapter we're going to be looking at this time is chapter 11, Aslan is Nearer. So if you haven't read the chapter, what a disgrace, um, you can run and catch up on your reading now. Uh, it runs from Edmund, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time, and it goes all the way to if either of you mention that name again, said the witch, he shall instantly be killed. Now, the chapter title struck me, um, before we even start on the words in the chapter, because Aslan is nearer, encouraged me to look for symbols and uh, literary or textual connections in this chapter. This might not be a huge surprise, given that's clearly what I've been doing so far, but... The fact that it's called Aslan is Nearer suggested to me that we might see a level of, of symbolism in this chapter. After all, we already know from the previous text that we're not following Aslan's story. We're not going to be switching, probably, from Aslan's point of view to the children's point of view and back again. So if Aslan's going to be Nearer, he's going to have to be perceptual, percep perceptible in the story somehow that doesn't involve simply him appearing or people saying, gosh, I think Aslan's near. Do you think? Yes, I think he's near. He's probably going to arrive in a minute, isn't he? Um, so I thought there might be symbols, connections, objects, tones, feelings, something that that sort of signifies Aslan's presence as near without us actually seeing this character. So as I say, this chapter title set up an expectation that we might see a certain amount of symbolism and reference. So the chapter begins with Edmund finding some rather disagreeable changes and transformations in his experience. As it says, Edward, meanwhile, had been having a most disappointing time. And he asks for more Turkish delight, uh, and the Queen uh, tells him to not to be a fool uh, and to be silent, and then says that, after all, he should be fed so that he doesn't faint on the way. Uh, another dwarf appeared. Bring the human creature food and drink, she said. Dwarf went away and presently returned, bringing an iron bowl with some water in it and an iron plate with a hunk of dry bread on it. He grinned in a repulsive manner as he set them down on the floor beside Edmund and said, Turkish delight for the little prince. Ha ha ha. Take it away, said Edmund sulkily. Um, and Edmund, in the end, ends up uh, eating the bread and drinking some of the water. And this transformation uh, in his fortunes is, is noted by Edmund, feeling sad and disappointed. But it struck me that, there's, again, there's something oddly precise about it. Um, precision in symbols is something that I think matters uh, enormously for Lewis, uh, and it's why I've been looking out for these sort of parallels or references. On one level, he, he's expected he's expecting to become a king or a prince, and instead he's being treated very badly. But again, I think there's something more more exact going on. He's asked for Turkish delight, and he's been brought bread and water. He's asked for uh, banqueting food, royal food, and instead he's brought the food of a prisoner, and he's mocked by being told, ah, this is Turkish delight for the little prince. But I think that mocking actually reveals a truth in that these, this is the food served to prisoners. Unknowingly, he has become a prisoner. He is, he is uh, as a hint earlier, that he's sort of potentially addicted to this food, and it's food that um, makes you want it and never, never satisfies you. Um, and as he's been imagining this marvellous castle, and he arrives and finds this place with all these stone animals, and it's cold and everyone's horrible, um, I think this is not so much that the opposite is happening, as actually he's it is being revealed to him what's actually going on. That even when he was eat, drinking from a silver cup uh, and eating this magical box of Turkish delight, he was in fact eating the equivalent of stale bread uh, and drinking uh, water out of iron. But now he's realising what's actually going on. Um, something similar, I think, happens later when he's on the sledge. Meanwhile, the dwarf whipped up the reindeer and the witch and Edmund drove out under the archway and on and away into the darkness and the cold. This was a terrible journey for Edmund, who had no coat. Before they had been going a quarter of an hour, all the front of him was covered with snow. He soon stopped trying to shake it off because, as quickly as he did that, a new lot gathered, and he was so tired. Soon he was wet to the skin, and oh, how miserable he was. It didn't look now as if the witch intended to make him a king. All the things that he said to, him, said to himself to make him believe that she was good and kind and her side was really the right side sounded silly to him now. So again, uh... uh it's disappointment, um, it's a reversal of fortune, but that, that detail interests me very much, that he soon stopped trying to shake off the snow, because as soon as he did that, a new lot gathered. 
Now, we've seen snow on someone earlier in this book. This is how he realises that the lion in the witch's courtyard isn't a live lion because he says, oh, it's, there's snow on its back. There's no way that uh, any live animal would let that happen to it. I believe, incidentally, this is not true. Um, that if you look, I think, yaks and certain kinds of, of particularly hardy sheep up in the Lake District, I believe, um, snow lies on their backs and this shows that they're so well insulated, in fact, that they can keep all their bodily warmth inside um, and that not enough is escaping to melt the snow. But that agricultural detail, which I may or may not have got right, um, is beside the point here. He finds himself ending up in the same situation as he's seen other creatures who've been touched by the witch. He finds himself delivering a coating of snow as if he's no longer a lively creature, no longer someone who moves around and lives and speaks and has all the attributes of who he is, but that he's, he's apparently starting to calcify uh, in the same way that he thought he was going to be a prince, but he's, he's seeing himself now as a prisoner, as someone who served dry bread and water, and indeed has been eating the equivalent of that all along. He's been enslaved by this Turkish delight. He's now, this is very little detail implies that he's now gradually turning to stone. He's now ceasing to become uh, his own truth, his own potential, and instead calcifying into this, this hard, lifeless, outer form. And we see a, uh, an example of this happening when the witch comes across uh, the animals who are having their feast. Uh, and they're all uh, eating and drinking, and the witch is appalled by this and says, what is the meaning of all this gluttony, this waste, this self-indulgent? Where did you get these things? Please, your majesty, said the fox, we were given them. And if I might make so bold as to drink your majesty's very good health, who gave them to you, said the witch. For Father Christmas, stammered the fox. What, roared the witch, springing from the sledge and taking a few strides nearer to the terrified animals. He has not been here. He cannot have been here. How dare you? But no, say you have been lying, and you shall even now be forgiven. And at that moment, one of the young squirrels does this sort of slightly mad tiny Tim thing and goes, he has, he has, he has, and bangs his spoon, and it's all up for everyone. And Edmund pleads for, for mercy for them, um, but she zaps them anyway. Um... And again, I think there's some really interesting and telling details here where, first of all, Edmund, though he is calcifying, begs for mercy for them. He There's this moment of sort of moral breakthrough, if you like, where he says, oh, oh please don't punish them like this. Edmund's been really feeling really cross with the whole world um, and, and he's feeling upset with himself and disappointed. Um, but at this moment, he asks mercy for others. And I think this is a, a moment that we might relate to the, the title of the chapter, that Aslan is near, that there is something about uh, Edmund's act that reveals the potential presence of Aslan in this situation, um, that he doesn't ask uh, for benefit or for mercy for himself. He asks it for others. Oh, don't, don't, please, don't, shouted Edmund. And she strikes him, uh, and, and uh, there's a, a fleck of blood on him. So he asks for mercy for others, and in doing so, he is uh, wounded himself. A very, very small detail, but I think one that plays into the much larger narratives that we all know are going on in this text about uh, atonement, uh, about sacrifice, self-sacrifice, uh, about suffering on behalf of others. Because Edmund has this very small and ultimately unsuccessful moment of suffering on behalf of the mercy uh, that might be given to others, but of course in this case isn't given. It's also interesting, I think, that the witch tells them to lie. She says, he has not been here, he cannot be here, how dare you? But no, say you have been lying and you shall even now be forgiven. Now, this is a, a, a trait of, of uh, tyrannous rulers uh, throughout history, you know, from, from Herod onwards. And I think there's a, there's a deliberate bit of Herod in the White Witch um, in, the, in this narrative. She, you know, she, she forces people to lie in, you know, in, in things like Orwell's 1984 um, and uh, Animal Farm, indeed, both of which Lewis reviewed. In fact, he thought Animal Farm was a significantly better book than 1984, and he was rather cheesed off that everyone seemed to disagree with him and think that uh, 1984 was the greater novel. But there's a concern in, in writing about tyranny, obviously, in this period, that what tyrants do is not only uh, hurt people and oppress people and injure them, but they seek to warp reality. They seek to uh, destroy the notion of truth itself, not simply to to commit wrong actions, but to destroy the idea of, of the distinction between good and evil. A very biblical principle, of course, there is that, that passage, uh, woe unto those who put good for evil. I've always been interested by that word put there. Not say good is evil, but 
trying to replace one category with another wholesale, who try to do epistemic injustice to those who are around them. I mean, it's in a passage, if, if memory serves, where it also talks about, about buying the lands of the poor uh, and profiting unfairly from harvests uh, and property, that there's, there's some sense that there's economic injustice going here, and there's actual epistemic injustice going on. People are seeking to, to redefine reality in a way that removes not only the, the, uh, the potential of justice happening, but of justice even being recognised as a possibility, the hope of justice, we might say. So she seeks to do that. She seeks, she seeks to make everyone lie to please her, to, to create this bubble of reality around herself. And I think this is one in the eye for Peter. I think this is a, a little a little mirror for magistrates for him, a little glass of government, um, to, to quote those two books, um, that do, in the Renaissance depict bad rulers so that uh, people who are in, in positions of authority should, should profit from the, the stories of, of people who ruled badly. Because, of course, Peter has come close to doing that earlier on. We've had Peter being installed as this great noble guy with his sword and his shield and he's clearly going to be the leader amongst the children. We haven't had quite the prophecy of, of uh, necessarily of him being high king yet uh, from Aslan, but he's certainly going to be a, a, a ruling figure. But he did something that comes close to this early on, where he was so keen that Lucy should say that she was lying. Uh, when he says, oh, this is... We'll make it a joke, right? We'll, we'll say there isn't a Narnia, but you were joking. Isn't that funny? Haven't you hoaxed us? Good. Is that okay? And she says, no, no, there is Narnia. And he says, come on, like, drop it. I think you're going too far. This is not funny. How, how about you drop it and you say that you were lying? And she says, no, no, I can't do that. And, and Lucy's made very unhappy by this. And he's, he seeks, in a much smaller way, to get someone to say that they were lying in order uh, that the, sort of, the, the state of of play should be maintained, uh, that things should be easier, that the, the family unit should stay together and all agree. Um, and here, I think there's a, just a whisper that of the kind of unrighteousness, the kind of, kind of political unrighteousness that Peter has got on the edge of um, by saying that, that Lucy should say she was lying, and we see it sort of magnified in a, in a horrific way, a, a real tyranny here. Not that I'm suggesting that, that Peter is a tyrant, but in a text that is concerned with politics and with rule, as well as with personal morality and the connections between them, I think the witch shows us here the, the potential flaws of Peter, as well as uh, Edmund, which we are shown abundantly elsewhere in this book, blown up to horrific size and horrific form. So as they continue to travel, we get a sense that Aslan is near because um, some sort of thaw starts. And in that silence, Edmund could at last listen to the other noise properly. A strange, sweet, rustling, chattering noise, and yet not so strange, for he'd heard it before. If only he could remember where. Then all at once he did remember. It was the sound of running water. All around them, though out of sight, there were streams, chattering, murmuring, burbling, splashing, and even in the distance, roaring. And his heart gave a great leap, though he hardly knew why, when he realised that the frost was over. And much nearer there was a drip, drip, drip from the branches of all the trees. And it goes on to, to describe uh, the trees, which I will massively overread in a second. Um, but there's another, I think, cluster of imagery here. Obviously, in, in the, the Narnian world that, that has been described, time and the world is locked into this joyless, frozen, heartless, uh, um, eternal winter but no Christmas that we've seen. So on one level, this is simply... Or not simply, but it's evidence of the closeness of Aslan, that something's happening, that time is beginning to work properly, the seasons are potentially returning, uh, the the real time is, is breaking in, that Aslan's warming and revivifying uh, influence is having some effect. I also think this is, there's a symbolic image here in that it's interesting that Aslan's presence, if we do read this as, as uh, evidence of Aslan's presence, is expressed by water. Living streams of water, water of life, the water that will uh, allow us never to thirst again. You can see where I'm going with this. That the idea that the world is suddenly pervaded by images not of, of frost and snow and ice, but of moving water, living water, flowing water, water that breaks through the fixity of uh, sin and oppression uh, and um, death, in that sense, this, this calcifying that we've seen uh, happening throughout the novel so far. Um, it's also significant, I think, that the water splashes and bubbles and chatters, um, but it also in the distance roars. It's like a lion, this water, somehow. And, of course, 
the, the Lion of Judah and the Living Water are images that can come together in the, in the person of one person uh, in the Bible. So I mentioned I was going to overread the, the vegetation, and here we go. Soon there were more wonderful things happening. Coming round a corner into a glade of silver birch trees, Edmund saw the ground covered in all directions with little yellow flowers, stellandines. The noise of water grew louder. Presently they actually crossed a stream. Beyond it they found snowdrops growing. Mind your own business, said the dwarf, when he saw that Edmund had turned his head to look at them, and he gave the rope a vicious jerk. But of course this didn't prevent Edmund from seeing. Only five minutes later he noticed a dozen crocuses growing round the foot of an old tree, gold and purple and white. Then came a sound even more delicious than the sound of water. Close beside the path they were following, a bird suddenly chirped from the branch of the tree. And, and he, he goes to continues to detail these uh, features of spring that he sees. Um, and again, I was struck that Lewis actually named the plants. Um, I thought it was a detail that was worth following up on. Um, so I, I'm, I'm not someone who knows about uh, horticulture, so I looked up these plants, I looked up their Latin names, because I know that Lewis is not only someone who, who spoke ancient languages, but he was interested in the medieval and Renaissance worldview that saw consonances between things, that saw herbal law and planetary law um, and all this kind of thing, law about stones and metals and this sort of thing. Um, so I found the Latin name of Celandine, which is Ficaria verna, and apologies if I'm uh, pronouncing that wrongly. It's also known as Pilewort, which is interesting, didn't seem significant. Um, and I looked up whether there were any traditional or magical associations with it. Uh, it's used to treat piles, that's the, the name. And it's also apparently used or was used by Nicholas Culpepper, the famous herbalist in the 17th century, to treat scrofula. Now, that did catch my eye because there are two things there that I think are significant, and neither of them have to do with piles. Um, first of all, Ficaria verna. If my Latin is standing up, that means the spring fig. Uh, so it, it's got the word spring in its name. The very first uh, flower that he noticed is called uh, spring. That's part of its name. So it's a, it's a symbol for the spring. And if Culpepper used it to attempt to treat scrofula in his daughter, um, there's another way to treat scrofula very famously. Scrofula is known as the king's evil because it's supposed to be curable by the touch of a king's hand. It's a, a, a superstition that was particularly um, uh, harped on uh, when the European kings were sort of building the, the idea of the divine right of kings. There was something particularly special about a king's person. And of course, that implies potentially that the appearance of this plant is like the touch of a king's hand, or like the presence of a king. There is, there is a healing potential in it. And I think you, you can obviously make parallels, though I'm not familiar with any, but I'm sure they were made in the, in the uh, Renaissance or the medieval period between the people who were healed by being touched by Jesus, or in cases the woman with the hemorrhage simply touching him, and the potential of the king to cure by, by touching. So there's, there's perhaps a sense there that Aslan's presence is... is being signalled to us under a highly coded and a highly uh, erudite way that this word, the spring fig, and this plant that can be analogous to the touch of a king's hand, a true king's hand, unlike the queen who's currently ruling. Um, I also looked up crocuses and discovered that one of their one of their varieties is the crocus vernus, again the the spring crocus. Uh, I looked up snowdrops. Snowdrops have not got the word uh, vernal or vern in them. But they have got one French name, which interested me, Personnage, the snow piercer, the one that breaks through the snow. Um, it's highly, highly apt, obviously, for this scene, particularly when Father Christmas has said in the previous chapter, she's been trying to keep me out with her winter, she's been trying to keep me out, but I've broken through and I'm here now. And that just as some of the elements of Father Christmas are perhaps a, a signal that some of the aspects of Aslan are entering the world, is either this little flower is piercing through the snow, it's doing its part in, in breaking through the stranglehold that the witch has on this world. Now, there are objections to what I've just said. Um, as I said, I was going to overread the flowers. Of course, there is a, there's an obvious objection that I'm taking these to be scholarly references based on their Latin names or based on what Nicholas Culpepper may or may not have done with them in the 17th century, and saying, aha, these two flowers have the word spring in their name and this one has the word snow in its name so that means that there's a as a, a consonance here there's some sort of symbol being built the answer to that of course potentially 
is that, duh, these are spring plants, so of course people called them things like spring this or spring that, and it comes with the snow, and therefore it's called the snow piercer. And we've got a scene here where a, a magical spring is happening, so obviously there are going to be spring flowers. That's true, and I must admit, I haven't got a very good answer for that. <laughs> I, the only answer I can make is that it seems to me significant that the particular flowers that he mentioned are so very loaded verbally and textually with associations of, of snow ending and spring arriving, and that little touch of, of the king's hand in the case of the celandine. But I'm willing to accept that I may be overreading it, and there's a, there's a natural explanation in that he mentioned spring flowers because it's spring. However, I'm fairly convinced that there's a symbolic significance to the last point I'm going to make, which is about the end of the chapter. This is no thaw, said so the dwarf suddenly stopping. This is spring. What are we to do? Your winter has been destroyed, I tell you. This is Aslan's doing. If either of you mention that name again, said the witch, he shall instantly be killed. Now, just as with the, the, the previous passage we discussed about the, the witch's desire to stop people saying things she doesn't like, that she wants to create this bubble of, of uh, things that please her around her, and indeed persuade other people that reality itself has changed. I think we see that here again, the, the tyrant's desire not to have the truth pointed at. But I think something also more significant is going on in that we've seen that that name actually does do things. She's not, she's not entirely being stupid or unwise trying to prevent her subjects from speaking the name of Aslan. She's being wrong. She's being oppressive and, and evil and sinful. But she's not being stupid. It's not self-defeating um, because the name actually does things. As we've seen earlier, the, the children have these mysterious feelings. Uh, they have mysterious inspirations when the name of Aslan is used, and we paralleled that um, to the biblical passage that talks about what happens at the name of Jesus. It's worth, I think, paralleling that with the refusal of people to use the name Voldemort um, in the Harry Potter novels. They talk about, you know, he shall not be named, or you know who, etc. And in that, uh, I think it's... It's clearly a, a much more secular political concept, the idea, because they, they're wrong to do it, it's made clear that Harry is, is right in using the name Voldemort because names can't hurt you and we shouldn't believe in this sort of superstition. And if you can name things correctly and if you can be true and point out the, you know, what's honest and what's true, then you've got a better chance of avoiding oppression. Here I think we have a, a similar interest in, in truth and a similar interest in breaking oppression. But there seems to be a much stronger sense that names actually do have power, uh, that calling on a particular name. And we might think there of uh, later of, of the horse and his boy, they have called upon Tash and Tash has come, etc. Um, that actually the name of Aslan can both point to what's going on. It can articulate these scattered little images of mercy, of uh, flowers coming through the snow, of the colour of a, of a flower that's like the touch of a king's hand all these hints that there is a presence uh, in this chapter that's not yet been articulated except on the very last lines of the chapter, and that the name can actually do things in the world. So those are the things that struck me on reading this chapter, and I'd be really interested to hear about what struck you and whether <laughs> whether you think my uh, mangling of, of Latin flower names is to any account, perhaps, or other things that interested you. All right, the next chapter we'll be looking at is chapter 12, Peter's First Battle. It runs from while the dwarf and the white witch were saying this, and it runs along to, and whatever happens, never forget to wipe your sword. So I look forward to talking to you about that. <laughs>